I'm Adam Sexton from WMUR, and it's a tremendous honor to be here today uh, to conduct the Governor's Roundtable for the Bicentennial of the New Hampshire State House. Thank you for being in attendance. Uh, this is uh, the arena of politics in New Hampshire, but it's also uh, sacred ground as the home of uh, our representative democracy. And uh, we have here today a great treat in uh, more than a quarter century of governance, or just about a quarter century of governance. Uh, between these governors. So let's just introduce, uh, starting with uh, our uh, governor from 1983 to 1989, Governor John H. Sununu. Please stand. Oh. Governor Steve Merrill, the governor from 1993 to 1997. Senator Jean Shaheen, the governor from 1997 to 2003. Governor Craig Benson, who served from 2003 to 2005, right there. Governor Maggie Hassan from 2013 to 2017, and Governor Chris Sununu, who served from 2017 until currently. All right, and everyone has their microphones. You can take a seat. All right. So this will be a debate format. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to start uh, with some easy stuff, and it's all going to be easy because this is uh, so great to have uh, so much here in terms of governance and experience. Uh, and we're going to start uh, with the most experienced, uh, Governor John H. Sununu. And if Governor Sununu, if you could just share with us, uh, what do you think about when you walk into this building, and uh, what are some of the moments that really stick with you from your time here? Well, this is a, a very special building. Uh, it's 200th anniversary of it, but. But more than that, uh, th this building um, has seen not only its uh, great share of legislative action and, and governors interacting with the legislature, but uh, remember, every time somebody wants to run for president, they go to the corner office there where the Secretary of State is and they have to register. And uh, it, it, it is an opportunity for people who aspire to the highest office to see uh, a building that I think represents the great traditions of New Hampshire. But, but for me, the, the, you, you asked us to talk a little bit about a special moment that we had in the building as governor. I, I think, thought a little bit, and I came, decided that I'd like to talk to you about uh, September 18th, 1985. Uh, president Reagan was president, I was governor at the time, and uh, Ronald Reagan was trying to push through his tax cutting and his tax reform packages and decided that he needed a forum for the country to see how important keeping taxes low really was. And so he chose to come here to the State House in, in New Hampshire. Um, it was interesting, he knew New Hampshire well. Uh, he had been here, as I said, a number of times to register for the primary, but he had never taken the time to go through the building and I found it fascinating that he was just astounded at how small the building was, having come from California, where they have a, about an aircraft carrier size building uh, as their uh, legislative and gubernatorial facilities. But after he went through the building, he went out front and, and stood on the steps and gave a speech. There were there was really not a single space left out there for anybody else to stand. And I looked for a great picture of it and I couldn't find it. I, it's somewhere in the closet at home. But Ronald Reagan standing there with about 10,000 people talking uh, about how important it is to keep taxes low in a state that is really the gold standard for keeping taxes low. But what really was the exclamation point on, on what he said that day is in the last two paragraphs of his presentation, uh, he talked about the fact that Reverend Benjamin Weir, who had been held as a captive in Lebanon for two years by terrorists, had just been released. And, and that for me really uh, capped what was an extremely uh, special day, not only in my life as governor, but I think in the life of this building uh, as, the, as the State House of the State of New Hampshire. All right, Governor Merrill, a special remembrance of your time here at the State House. Um, <clears throat> I love the building. Um, 
But as some of you may know, I ran for governor for the first time and started a family for the first time at the age of 47. So I am certifiably insane. <laughs> and one of the deals was that Heather, because she worked as well, our two kids were home, and so I would pick up the food and bring it home. And if she was too tired, I'd cook it, or we'd cook it together. So there's an arena just down from the State House, and there's a farm stand behind the arena in the spring. And so in the spring, I went down, left the State House, went down, and I got there about 5 o'clock, 5.15, and there were three sweet little old ladies buying things. And I got out of the car, and they looked at me, and they were thrilled that I was there. And they were saying, these are really good. These just came in. You're really going to like these. And so I was buying things as they were telling me to, what to do. And uh, then they checked out, and I went up to check out. And the woman that was checking me out was about 25 years old. And she said, do you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no. She said, why does everybody seem to know you? <laughs> and I said, well, I work up there at the State House. And she said, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm, I'm the governor. And she said, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I don't live around here. I said, really, where do you live? And she said, hooks it. <laughs> <laughs> So I've never really, I mean, I could live with Montana, all right? I can live with Montana. Hook said I can't live with. So every time I see the State House, I think of that day. <laughs> all right, and Governor Senator Shaheen, uh, from your time here, what do you think about when you walk into this building? Well, as the governors have both said, um, this is a historic building that means so much to all of the people of New Hampshire. It always struck me um, when I would meet people um, particularly children, and I did a lot of work on kids when I was governor, that all of the children knew that I worked in the building that had the Golden Dome. That's what they knew. But, you know, I think about my, what for me was so exciting was the day I got inaugurated governor for the first time, and there's all the hoopla going on and everything, and, you know, all my family was here, and Molly, my youngest, almost fell asleep. Some of you may remember I told, had to tell her to wake up while I was in the middle of my address. But, um, but then, you know, after all of the ceremony and people are leaving and I walked into the governor's office for the first time as the governor and was looking at the office and pulled out the drawer to my desk. Nothing was in it except a picture of Steve Merrill. <laughs> And I turned it over, and it said, blame it all on this guy. <laughs> and of course, when I asked him about it, he said, oh yeah, Judd Gregg did the same thing for me. He left me a picture. That's great. Uh, Governor Benson, what are some of your favorite remembrances of your time? So what I love about this place is it's open. People can come in and walk around and see things. And I have one story that sort of speaks to that specifically. There was a, a young eight-year-old boy accompanied by his parents from South Carolina that was touring all the state houses in the Northeast. He had been diagnosed with cancer and had six months to live. And none of the other governors came out and saw him. We were the last stop on their tour. So I have a beautiful woman that was in the, the lobby, the, just a terrific person, and they called me up and said, would you come out and see him? I said, sure. So I came out and we started talking and I said to him, do you want to see what real governors do? He said, sure, I'd love to do that. So I took him back. I had some Nerf golf balls and a golf club and we had a hallway. So we started hitting golf balls down to the other end of the hallway and he had the best time of his life. And I was thinking, no other place could this happen for this young man. He was so happy and sadly he did pass away. Um, but I, I just felt good that New Hampshire could provide him this sort of opportunity to see things that you couldn't see anywhere else and being so open and, and available is, is what we do here in New Hampshire. We take it for granted, but it's not so for granted. Governor Hassan. Well, I, I certainly would echo what Governor Benson just said about the openness and the number of times people just coming through the State House, especially from outside of the state, 
Um, and I'd go out and introduce myself to them and they'd be so surprised um, and it speaks to the openness. But I think what I would focus on today is that I think it was exactly 10 years ago that Governor Lynch signed marriage equality into law in the state of New Hampshire. And I have thought a lot about the way that law got passed and what it says about this place. Because you may remember that first the House passed the bill, which those of us in the Senate weren't quite expecting. Civil unions had been passed a couple of years earlier. And now the Senate needed to figure out what to do. And we were, the caucus was down in the Senate finance room, which is a room for everybody who knows this place that at budget time can be overflowingly full with the intensity of everybody trying to hear every word that every member of finance says. In that time, it was where we were hashing out our own understanding and um, opinions about how we should move forward as a caucus. And that needed to happen in that room in private, um, but certainly not in secret because people knew we were there. Um, and then we ended up passing our version of marriage equality on the Senate floor. And that was heralded with great excitement. But Governor Lynch had concerns about the language that we had passed. So now we had to find a way talking with Governor Lynch in the governor's office uh, to figure out how we might get to yes with the chief executive. And now you have that corner office engaged in this process. So in order to get Governor Lynch's um, support and willingness to sign it, we had to find a House bill to attach the new language to, to amend what the Senate had done, which brought all the senators back up into the gallery to watch the House pass the final combination of language that was going to make equality possible for so many people in our state, that sense of belonging. Um, and in the course of all of this legislative action involving all of us in various rooms and places in this building, throughout the time there was a steady trail of people who came into this building for the first time to talk to their elected leaders, to seek us out. Some of them were people who you know, had roles to play in the lobbying effort, but lots of them were people who would just look at you and say, are you a senator? And you'd say yes, and they'd say, I gotta talk to you about this. I have a child, I have a sister, I have a parent who would be helped by this bill. All of it came together to deliver legislation that John Lynch signed 10 years ago that has changed the life of so many people in our wonderful state with the motto, live free or die, giving freedom to everyone. And so many people formally and informally sought us out in this building because they knew they could uh, to make real change. And it involved every aspect, every office, every person in this building. And it was a great privilege to be a part of. Governor Sununu, the memory is a bit more fresh, but uh, go ahead. Very fresh sometimes. Too fresh. Um, well, uh, in terms of like memorable moments, you know, I, I, could, I could say it was very memorable when I was introduced as the governor and the Speaker of the House got my name wrong, but that would embarrass Speaker Shirtliff, and I don't want to do that. Uh, I just see him back there getting redder at the moment. Um, no, you know, I was thinking about this right before. It was probably right, the, the most memorable moment for me so far is probably right before I got sworn in. And I'm guessing it's similar for all of us. I was scared to death. Uh, about an hour before you first get sworn in in your first term, you're like, uh-oh, like this is really happening. And um, I knew my family would be there. And I didn't, uh, as I think a lot of folks know, I really didn't write a, an inaugural speech. I had some notes and some bullets, for better or for worse. So I was scared to death about delivering an inaugural speech that really technically didn't exist. Um, and I had seen the press come in and yell at my press person, give us the speech. And my press person going, there's no speech. I don't know what he's going to say. And I thought, oh, man, I've really put everyone in a tough position. So I, was, I had a lot of anxiety. And I took Leo, my little guy, who I think was five or four or five at the time. And we just went for a walk outside, like right before. And we were out in the snow. It was cold. It was kind of fresh air. Got my wits about me. We were playing in the snow for a while. People were walking in 
oh, did we miss it? And I'm like, no, no, just go get a seat. I'll be up there in a minute. And uh, so that was, that moment with Leo was very similar. Uh, not, that my, not that my dad ever took me for a walk outside the state house, but just kidding. Um, but it, again, because I was a son of a governor and I was in a very similar position. My, I think I was in the second grade when my father became governor. So it was a bit reflective there. And then when you add on to what Senator, Senator Hassan and Governor Benson talked about, the accessibility, it really helps set your priorities. And that's, uh, I don't want to sound overly cliched, but it's not about us, right? It's about the next generation, it's about kids, it's about all these things we want to do. And we talk a lot about mental health and opioids and kindergarten and all those things. At the end of the day, it's the solutions that are all about making sure you're, you're having a system that is taking care of kids, so long term those, those are in place. That doesn't happen if you don't have the accessibility piece. If you can't let those families come in, or the fourth graders do the tour, or that individual child be able to come in and spend a little time putting in, in you know, a little time with the governor and saying, boy, this can really work. And by work, it's, we can have communication and the people can really drive the process. So for me, it's, it was probably that moment that defined, help, helps me define a lot of my priorities going forward. You know, it, it grounds you. And, whether, and everyone has a different, something different that grounds them. Family, faith, whatever it might be. But you need something to ground you because this can become very, I don't want to say lofty. Um, it can be all about this building sometimes. And it is so much not about this building in many ways. Great representation, great access. It's a great tool for the people, but it's just the tool. It's really about the 1.35 million people outside of this building. And so you always need something, I think, for me at least, I need something to ground me. And it's probably that moment, you know, being out there with Leo right before, you know, it all, it all hit. Speaking of being grounded, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the building itself right now. Governor Sununu, is there a spot in the state house, other than the governor's office, of course, where you really feel at home or you really love to be? Well, I think one of the <clears throat> important places in this building that, that um, I really, uh, contrary to, to the myth and the legend about governors, uh, I really got to enjoy my governor and council meetings in that chambers there. I think, I think that that room really represents another way that New Hampshire is absolutely unique. We, we are really the only ones, even though Massachusetts has a name, an executive council, a governor's council, we're the only one that can, has one that continues to function and be a serious part of government. And, and what that process is, is a process of transparency. You see in that chamber when the governor and council meet, you see the governor and the council debating the merits of appointments publicly. And most importantly, every significant contract, I think it's 10,000 now, uh, every contract over 20. What's it at? <laughs> I'm old, remember? Anyway, every significant contract in the state gets presented publicly there, and if there's any disagreement about it, if there's any concern about it, it gets debated publicly, completely transparent, and open. And to me, therefore, that, that room really is, is part of, of defining how transparent this state is relative to the other states, and, and, and I always enjoy going in that room and, and uh, it is a, a, a classic piece of this building. Governor Merrill, how about you? About a favorite spot within the building? Um, believe it or not, it, <clears throat> it's the dome. When I became governor, it was time to put the new gold leaf on the dome. And the dome is spectacular. I, every time I drive by, it just gives me a great feeling. And we had a couple of competitors. And I chose a gentleman who worked with his family and they put the gold leaf on in pieces no bigger than that with a hammer. It took forever for them to put it on, which is why they were considered the best in the country. And nobody wanted them hired except me. And I knew why, because after I hired them, everybody hated them within a week. It was, uh, it was, I was the only friend the guy had. I'm sure they would have driven him out of the state. But he said one day, will you go up to see the dome? I'm almost done, and I'd like you to see how it's done. And I said, sure, because and when you look up there, it's just a wonderful, strong structure that represents who we are. 
Well, when I went up there, it wasn't like that at all. There were boards that I had to walk across. If I'd fallen down, I would have gone 100 feet. I didn't know I was going to be doing that. So I was like, I, I yelled, you like this? I thought, this is great. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And, but to see the work that was done, and it's just as beautiful today as it was when it was done. So I always think about the dome. It, it's a lot like life. It looks very strong from the outside. From the inside, it's quite different. Governor Shaheen. Well, I can attest to what Governor Merrill says because I was chair of the Capital Budget Committee when we were doing the dome, and I can tell you we did not want to hire those folks. <laughs> so you, you, were, you were very right in your explanation for what was happening there. Um, you know, obviously, being governor was very special. I mean, it's something that so few people get to do. And so I love the governor and council chamber. But for me, it's really the state senate chamber. Um, it is so historic, and the murals, and it's just been redone, so if you haven't poked your head in to look, it's beautiful. But the murals that depict New Hampshire history and the debates that go on, you know, our country is really about democracy. It's about making sure, I mean, that's part of the um, importance of the openness of the state house here. And the debate that went on in the state Senate, the fact that every bill that gets introduced into the legislature here gets a hearing and gets debated. I mean, that's what our democracy should be about. And that, to me, really represents the importance of the state house and the importance of our democracy here, in, not only in New Hampshire, but in the country. Governor Benson. I'd say we're in the room. I uh, had my portrait painted here. I got uh, Sean Jasper to agree to uh, speaker to allow me to be painted here. And the reason is I love 400 people representing a state that get paid $100 a year, uh, except for the speaker gets a few more bucks. But um, this is like no other place in any state in the country where the most represents. There's no other body that's 400 people, none. And that represents anybody in the United States other than the Congress. Um, and so it says a lot that we have 400 people willing to come here for that $100 a year. And we all have different ideas and we can be honest and free about it because nobody's getting anything more than their satisfaction of working for a great state. And so it's really a special place here. And, and I also happen to like Bill Gardner's office because it has so much history and they've done such an awesome job of preserving so many records and doing so many things to preserve our character that we have here in New Hampshire that so many people can feel a part of. Governor Hassan. So I think I would echo what everybody has said, and the way I would talk about it is what a Wednesday morning during session six months is like, because for the governor, it starts with breakfast with the executive council, often off campus at one of the agencies or if it's not session time, somewhere else around the state. But, but when it's session time, it starts with that breakfast and then you come back to the state house. And now the energy of the legislative day is beginning to build. And you come up the stairs and you say hello to people and there's people all through the hallways um, getting ready. And uh, one of the things I greatly appreciated uh, during my time as governor is uh, both speakers uh, welcomed me to the tradition of helping to open house session on Wednesday mornings. So we would come back from the breakfast, we'd go into the chamber, then we, I'd pop over here and help open um, the legislative session. And meanwhile, you would see the energy for the state senate, which sometimes is in session on Wednesdays, sometimes on Thursdays. But meanwhile, all the people who were coming to make their case or watch the votes were gathering and the hallway energy and just number of people would pick up and then you'd go back to the executive council chamber and I'll just add to what um, the first governor Sununu said which is it's very transparent and that's really important but you always started council days with honoring people in the state for some particular reason and usually with music from um, musicians of all ages, of all backgrounds, with all styles of music. 
And it was a reminder that at the end of the day, we do what we do in this democracy of ours because of the talent and energy of each and every one of us. And that talent and energy at the beginning of the council meetings with all the hubbub in the hallways was just a really centering moment about why we do what we do and the things you learn that you would never learn if you didn't invite people in to participate in every way that makes sense to them. And that this building can accommodate all of that is extraordinary. Governor Sununu? Well, uh, you know, again, I. A lot of great stories up up in the dome. Um, I think Bill Gardner's office is. If you want to know the history of this state, you can Google it, or you can just go ask Bill. Uh, he is really the, the the Google. And being uh, and and again, the key is to ask Bill a question, but not get pulled into his office because you'll never get out. You'll hear three. You'll go ask a question about a line in a bill, and you'll get a three-hour history of Daniel Webster. It, and God bless him, it'll be an a good history and there'll be a lesson in it somewhere. Uh, the key is to stand outside by Paula's desk and where all these governors, well, I'm just speaking for myself, but my guess is we've all stolen candy out of that candy dish on Paula Penny's desk uh, for the past 35 years. Um, amazing history there. But not to be overly repetitive, but I think the council chambers are really amazing. And the quick story I'll tell is, I was just remembering it as I sat here. Um, incredibly controversial vote on the most divisive issue you're going to find out there, Planned Parenthood, uh, sometime in the summer of 16, and the room is so packed, right? It's, it's not just public, it's really public, and the room is so packed with uh, a lot of folks wearing the, the, the pink stuff for Planned Parenthood, and there was a whole group of the pro-lifers wearing yellow, I think, and uh, smartly, Governor Hassan at the time said, hey, you know, let's do this vote first. I was just an executive counselor. And I, always, I was always in a very advantageous position as an executive counselor because I was from District 3, so I always got to sit directly across from the governor. So whether it was Governor Lynch or Governor Hassan, I was always looking to read the eyes on any issue. Okay, you know, what, what's going on? Now I'm nervous about what yeah. he's going to no, say. It, so this incredibly contentious vote's coming up, and frankly, I just know I'm going to be one of the, the, the pivotal votes. And everyone's, all the counselors are kind of having their say. And as this is happening, the room is so crowded, you have someone, a Planned Parenthood activist, or you know, just a, someone from the public, all dressed in pink, shoulder to shoulder with the governor on one side, and someone with the, the yellow pro-life stuff and the stickers, shoulder to shoulder with the governor on the other side, because it's just such a crowded room. And everyone is very civil and very respectful of the discussion. And it was just great to know that when the room got so crowded, crowded we didn't force them into the hall where they couldn't hear anything. The governor said, come on in, and just packed the entire room. So each of us had people shoulder to shoulder with us, all mixed and mingled. It wasn't like right. all the folks in pink were on one side and yellow was on the other. No, no. And so as the conversation is going around, the awesomeness of that moment, that would never, that cannot and would not happen anywhere else in this country. Zero. It just doesn't happen. But it happened here in that moment, and it could happen for any other issue at any other time, and it goes to the accessibility of government as a whole, the transparency of what we do, the open and public sessions, and the civility at which we do it by. Um, regardless of how the vote came out, it was three to two, um, the awesomeness of that moment, it was, it was hard not to really appreciate this is, this is really neat. And almost something that if you told that story in 49 other states, they literally wouldn't believe it. Yeah. That in the middle of a massive public debate, both sides are literally just the public. Anybody just standing shoulder to shoulder right behind with the governor and the counselors, all being actually not witnessing it, but actually being a part of it. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. That is a great segue to our question about how the nature of the State House and open government influenced your own governance and time in office. Governor Sununu. Well, I think this building uh, as, as a structure is, is a tangible symbol of, of what I think all of us really appreciate uh, is special about New Hampshire, and, and that is uh, that we worked hard to do more, to do it better with significantly less than the other 49 states, and I think we do a very good job of it. Each governor up here had staff total of maybe two or three if they were extravagant, four handfuls in terms of numbers of people they had as their staff. That's a factor of 10 and probably 100 less 
than virtually every other state. And it's represented to me, represented in, in, in the principle there is represented by this building. I mentioned how small it is relative to the other states. You go to Massachusetts or Connecticut or, or even Rhode Island, they're huge. So to me, this building always reminded me that there is a New Hampshire way. And when we take the oath of office, we may differ on a couple of issues here and there, but the fundamental principle of the New Hampshire way uh, is what we all tried to do when we were governors. And I think this building, every day you came here, uh, reminded you of that responsibility. Governor Merrill. Um, I, was, I served as chief of staff to Governor Sununu, and uh, he told me something that was so, was, was so important. He said, you know, when we get fighting here and we get contentious here, and, and our whole day is taken up with one single bill, I want you to know that 10 miles from here, they don't care. They don't know it, and they don't care. And I learned that, that it's, of course it's true. They've got their own lives to live. They expect us to use this building to produce justice for them. And so when I first became governor, I had a series of meetings in the morning, it promised to start at seven and out by nine, so that men and women could meet with me all around the state and tell me what their issues were. And I thought we needed a health care plan, and they very clearly told me we needed to fix workers' compensation. And so I came back and fixed workers' compensation. I would never have known that if I had stayed in the building. And it, it, I tried to get out as often as I could, talk to what I call real people, people that weren't caught up in politics or the political game. And so when I came back to this building, it was fresh and new. And I thought, you know, maybe I can really make the people of New Hampshire know that I'm trying to do something for them, not trying to do something just for the people in the building. Governor Shaheen. Well, for me, it was all of the fourth graders who come through this building as they're learning New Hampshire history. My grandson was here a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him what his favorite part of the building was. He said the Hall of Flags, which is always all of the kids' favorite part. But, you know, I can remember being in governor and council meetings and the fourth grade, um, when they're in the building, always poke their head in, and we would have them walk through um, governor and council and they would always come through and they'd wave when they saw that you were the governor and uh, they were smiling and laughing um, because as so many of us have said this really is about the future it's about what do we need to put in place to ensure that our children and grandchildren have a future that we want them to enjoy and so having the kids come in um, and really have a chance to participate in our democracy is, to me, um, what governing is all about. And that's what I, I tried to focus on that in lots of ways, from expanding public kindergarten to um, children's health insurance, because they are our future. Governor Benson, you touched on this a bit in your first story, but how did the nature of this building influence uh, your term as governor? Well, I, I think the thing is, is this small building is Governor Sununu said, um, does allow people to interface with each other very easily. But I think it's also important to realize we're in a small geographic state, and they can take the show on the road. Um, Governor Merrill said that 10 miles from here, nobody seemed to understand what we were trying to do. So I think all of us took a lot of time to go out on the road and, and talk to people and make sure that that information came back into this state house by seeing people in the hallways or the different venues uh, here and, and next door. Um, so uh, it, it's important for all of us to take advantage of this small building, but also this small state, to be able to connect with people in different ways. And I think we've all tried to do that in, in various and sundry ways. Um, and so uh, that is another New Hampshire advantage we don't think about, which is proximity, which helps a lot. Governor Hassan? I, I think what what all of us have been saying is in many ways this building is a crossroads of New Hampshire life because it is so accessible at some level because of where it's located. It's still a far ways from the North Country, but it's doable. And I think about a couple of things. One is I get asked a lot, uh, as I'm sure uh, 
Governor Senator Shaheen does too. You know, what's the difference between the two jobs? Which do you like better? And I always try to say to people, you have to understand the New Hampshire governorship. Job of governor is briefly to protect and love your state and every person in it. Um, but it's a consensus-based job because of the transparency that this building has nurtured and grown. And so you always have to remember as governor that everybody in New Hampshire has a say. Um, and it was a lesson also brought home to me when I was in the state Senate. One of the th things I've always appreciated about this building, although sometimes cursed it, is the lack of air conditioning <laughs> in these two chambers. And it was, I think, my first term in the state Senate. And it was a long budget day. We were right about now, maybe a week or two earlier in the session. And you know, you, the, 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 there's always a bottleneck of the hard bills that are waiting for you at the end of the session. The easy stuff gets disposed of first. But it's the hard, contentious, lots of amendments um, and the budget that is waiting for you at the end of the odd-numbered odd year session. And a bill that I had really worked on hard had gotten tabled with a 12-12 vote, which means gets laid on the table. It doesn't, well, it, it had been, actually had a tied, so it hadn't passed, and then we had tabled it. And there was somebody up in the gallery of the State Senate who really cared about that bill and knew that I could try towards the end of the session to take it off the table. And the ceiling fan's going around and around. It's about 90 degrees. And all of a sudden, it's like 7 o'clock in the evening, and I look up, and there is this one person left in the horrible heat up in the gallery because he didn't know what I was going to do about this bill. And I quickly wrote a note and had somebody take it up to him and say, I'm not trying to take it off the table. You can go home and you can get out of the heat. But it's also a reminder that every person who is here has a stake. And every person outside of this building has a stake. And you never can forget them. And that this building brings that home every day. Governor Sununu? You know, I, I find one of the interesting things of this building is that, um, unlike a lot of others, uh, the governor just parks outside, right? Right along the side of the building. And we walk in every day. And so there's, sometimes there's protesters or just people walking by and you can say hello. Um, that's very unique. I think in a lot of other places for security, they park in a garage downstairs or whatever it is and you don't even see the governor, right? But when you walk in, uh, I love the portraits. I'm a big, I, when I need a break, sometimes I'll just walk around and look at the portraits. There is one portrait in this state house that I see every day, and I love it. It's, I don't know if anybody knows, I'm looking at like Bill Gardner back there. It's the only portrait in the state house that actually has a quote on it. Every portrait has the name of the person. And it's, I, I think it's General James Miller. And the, the quote on top, on a plaque attached to it, how it got there, I don't know, it says, I'll try. That was his quote, I'll try, and it's down just outside of the press room. And I was fascinated by that, so I looked up, who, who's this General James Miller? I didn't even know. He's from Peterborough, um, was a governor, but not of New Hampshire. He was a governor of Arkansas, the, our, the territory of Arkansas. And in the War of 1812, there was a battle, I think it was up in Ontario somewhere, I'm, I might get this wrong, but they were trying to figure out who, who would go in and who would lead the charge, and he showed up and said, look, I'll try. And I love that because I, I come back to that sometimes because the job gets hard. I mean, the job is a great job. It's the greatest job in the world, really. But so there are days that are really tough, and it would be really easy to say, let's just take a pass. Let, let's let that go. Let's figure that one out next year. Let's leave that for the next administration. But I keep coming back to that quote every once in a while. And I'll say, look, I'll try. It might not work, but let's try. We might not get the votes, but let's try. This might not make sense to the general public, but if it's the responsible and right thing to do, I'll try, we'll try. So um, that's kind of, I, I, the fact that we walk into that state house and we walk by that portrait every day of this very unknown uh, individual, um, again, it allows the building to create a connectivity with leadership, whether it's in the House or the Senate or, or just the, the, um, the members of the House or the Senate or the governor or the executive council that, again, hopefully drives the right philosophy and the right approach to government. So. So, Adam, are you going to tell the story about why there's no air conditioning in the state house? And there should be no air conditioning in the I state did, house. This is, yeah, I hope <laughs> we'll stick with it. Go ahead. Why is there no air conditioning in the state okay, house? Okay, so 
Governor Sununu can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the legislature actually passed a bill when Mel Thompson was governor to air condition the state house, and he vetoed it because he said, if we air condition the state house, the legislature will stay all year long. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds believable. That was Mel Thompson. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> All right, and uh, you know that we've talked about the I'll try in the press room as well. It's all about the delivery. You're either saying I'll try or I'll try. Yeah. So, <laughs> it all depends all on how you delivery. say it, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's a good segue again. Uh, we have a little bit of time left for a favorite piece of artwork in the state house. This could be a painting, sculpture, anything like that. Well, 10 years before I got elected governor, uh, I served a term in the legislature. And uh, uh, so I sat through many long, long speeches. So I, I grew very uh, friendly with the five portraits up here. Uh, uh, Webster, Washington, Lincoln, Franklin Pierce, and, and John P. Hale. And I must say of the five, John P. Hale is my favorite. Uh, he was a congressman. He was a Democrat. He became disillusioned with the slave policies of the Democratic Party and grew very wise in his old age and died a Republican. <laughs> Governor Merrill? Um, my favorite uh, is the portrait of John Wynett, which you can see on the way down to the governor's office. I always looked at it every morning. Um, he just looks regal. He looks like the kind of person that should be a governor. And I, uh, Bill Gardner was kind enough to introduce me to the gentleman that wrote the autobiography, <clears throat> the biography of uh, John Wynett. He was a Republican. And most people don't know that JFK's father was the ambassador to the court of St. James. And FDR had appointed him. And he was so pro-fascist that he had to call him back. And he replaced him with the Republican governor of New Hampshire, John Wynett. And when World War II was over, John Wynett was one of the most popular people in England, right behind Winston Churchill. So he did a great job. He was, and John Wynett was also the first head of the Social Security Administration under Roosevelt. So he sort of did a transition the other way, Governor <laughs> Sununu. Instead of going from Democrat to Republican, he sort of was from Republican to Democrat. Even the um, score. <laughs> but my favorite, it's not... It is a work of art, although um, it's the clock in the council chambers. If you haven't had a chance to see the wonderful clock in the council chambers, it hasn't always been there. And I wish I could tell you the story. I'm sure some um, Bill Gardner or one of the historians here could tell the story of that clock. But we actually accepted it back officially on behalf of the state back when I was governor. And it's amazing. Governor, Mer uh, sorry, Governor Benson. So I saw Judge Gregg the other day. And I told him, that, are, are you coming? He said, no, I'm going to be in Scotland. I said, okay. I said, you've taken a lot of pressure off me. He said, why? I said, well, I was going to have to pick your portrait as my favorite because you're a member of my golf course and I don't like to disappoint my members. <laughs> so I, I, what I, I really, really like Jean Shaheen's portrait because she represents the first elected governor who's a woman. She's not the first woman governor, but the first elected woman governor in state history. So. I think that's a, a portrait done by Stoney Jacobs, an, an artist in New Hampshire who's a wonderful portrait artist. Well, I, I will agree with uh, Governor Benson because uh, Governor Shaheen's portrait uh, in the reception area of the governor's office says to every little girl in New Hampshire that she can be governor or senator or whatever she wants to be and for all of those kids who come through from outside of the state, it says the same thing. And we know role models are really important. Uh, so obviously, I love the portraits. Um, a couple of things, I was just sitting here. So Joe Dudley has the best haircut in the council chambers. It's this wild wig from the 1600s. Um, Dudley Dudley's portrait is now outside the yes. council chambers, which is interesting. And she had hers done twice, and the second version is way better than the first. It, it looks really good, actually. Um, I do love Governor Lynch's and Governor Shaheen's. I don't know if it was the same artist, but it's the best likeness. I mean, it's almost like a photo, and the reflection in the table of Governor Shaheen's is amazing. I don't know how the, the artist did that. Governor Gregg's is my favorite just because it's Mount Washington, and, and I love the, the but, um, and, and I'm the only governor to actually have his portrait hanging while he's governor because my father, being Mr. Clever, put a picture of us in the background. So my portrait's been here for years. <laughs> Technically, I'm about this big. I'm like a postage stamp in the back. But, so here's, I'm going to end by getting in real trouble. So the portrait I talk about the most is Governor Merrill's. 
Because Governor Merrill, if you know Governor Merrill, is the nicest, funnest, happiest, jolliest governor you could imagine. Always has a joke, always has a nice quip, never takes anything too seriously. It's the best. He's just the best governor. But that portrait looks so serious, and all the kids go, who's that? And I say, he's the nicest guy. It's, it's, but the portrait, I just got to tell you, it gets more comments than anybody. So I spend most of my time with fourth graders telling all the fourth graders what an amazing, fun, jolly governor Governor Merrill was. Because I just don't thank get the you, portrait. Thank you very much. I'm actually afraid of the portrait of myself. That's why it's not at home. Well, that's a, that's a safe place to end, I think. You know? So I'd like to thank everyone here. Uh, in particular, um, is this is a shrine to our representative democracy. Uh, what we're all about here in the United States and New Hampshire is uh, people of merit putting themselves forward, offering them to serve, and uh, the people, uh, the people selecting them as their leaders. And so uh, we'd like to give a big round of applause to our leaders who have led this state so well over the years. <laughs>